Well, good morning to you all, and um, we are again in the book of Revelation, so please will you turn there. As is often the case, Revelation uh, presents us with the challenge of spending a lot of time explaining the text and eating into time that we might otherwise have for applying it. And so sometimes a given message will be weighted one way or the other towards application or exposition. Uh, this particular message is, is mostly in the area of illustration and, and exposition. And because we're looking at the same theme, the last time on Revelation today and in weeks ahead, the same theme of uh, the dragon and how he wars against the church and stands against uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it will be a theme that will give us still time to explore more application uh, ahead. But my main burden this morning is understanding, and we will come to other points later on. So please, uh, yeah, Revelation chapter 12 and verses 7 to 12, and you'll hear that my first point is largely my introduction, so um, that, I'm keeping that in mind. Revelation 12 verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we begin to look at this text now this week, and as we hope in part to continue looking at it in the weeks to come, we ask for your help, Father. I ask for your help. Cause me to pass over anything that should not be said and, and bring to remembrance anything that should. Lord, cause your words by your Spirit to find fertile soil in all our hearts, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, to bring forward a harvest of righteousness. And be pleased, even in the midst of this message, which is so appropriately given to believers, be pleased all the same to prick the heart and conscience and mind of unbelievers who may be with us to awaken them to their awful danger, to their deception at the hands of the, the great dragon, that they would have the light of the knowledge of the truth and would come to call on the Lord Jesus Christ instead. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we were in the book of Revelation in December, in the true spirit of Christmas, we heard about a vicious dragon poised between the legs of a pregnant woman in birth, ready to devour her child. Now, if that sounds strange to you, especially in the context of Christmas, then you may want to go back and listen to it again, to that Christmas tapestry of a woman and a dragon, as we see it in verses 1 through 6. It is a symbolic history of the human race. It tells a story of God's plan to bring into the world a Savior, one who would be born through the, the line, the holy seed of a family. The woman in that story represents uh, the, that particular line, that community of believers from Eve and Abraham and David and so on, right up to Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. The dragon represents Satan, who from the very beginning of creation plotted to destroy humanity, to destroy that line, and all through human history worked against it, ready in each successive generation to deceive and devour again. And the male child, 
that was born to her at last represents Jesus Christ. God become man, the Savior of sinners arrived. For a while it appears that the dragon has won because look, Jesus is crucified. However, Satan has denied any victory because the male child, the Christ, is resurrected. He's taken up to his father's throne in heaven in triumph. Meanwhile, the woman, meaning that believing community of God's people, has to remain for a while in the wilderness, in the world, until Jesus returns. That's what we heard. And verses 1 to 6 describe these events from the perspective of earth, looking up. But now, verses 7 following, we're going to see it from the, the vantage point of heaven. The camera, if you like, it shifts from down here to a glimpse of up there. And the significance of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in hidden spiritual places. And before we look at the actual flow of the text, let me highlight for you a single character by way of introduction, because we first need to understand, first point now, that there was an accuser in the court of the king. An accuser in the court of the king. And perhaps it would be helpful at this point, and children, you can help me with your imagination, to think of a great royal castle court, the sort that we imagine in medieval fantasy. And, and understand that this is just an illustration using some scriptural points. It's in the spirit of John Bunyan or something like that. To help our understanding, I have confidence in your ability to see its limitations. But picture in heaven this great royal courtroom, this vast imperial throne room, one with one of those impossibly high ceilings that's covered intricately with beams and carvings of various kinds. You picture those smooth stone pillars running down the length of the court. Picture marble floors and, and, and great long windows letting in shafts of natural light. Along the wall there are these, these bright pendants, these, these war banners, these spoils of victory, each declaring the accomplishment of the universal emperor upon the throne. And along the great wide length of the approach, there's this deep red carpet, and it's lined on both sides by high-ranking, immaculately dressed warriors, sentinels, standing at attention, ready to do the bidding of the eternal ruler, seated high up on the dais, the, the almighty God and King. And also near the front, there stands the captain of these warriors, Michael, greatest of them all, with a long and heroic history of unfailing service. And then still more ranks, hosts of mighty angels, singing strongly, militantly, reverently of the character and the qualities of this king. It's a scene of majesty, of color, of music, of joy, of light, and of splendid purity. However, from time to time, a delegation of scheming, mocking, unholy creatures is somehow permitted to come into this pristine place. Though dressed up, though appearing to be dressed appropriately, disguising themselves as beautiful, they are in fact filthy and unclean, with the flies of Beelzebub buzzing around them as they slither forward towards the throne. There's a foulness to them. There's something repulsive. And, and all the holy sentinels around the room, they, they tighten their grip on their weapons. They, their knuckles turn white. They're watching. They're more alert. They are outraged that such things should be permitted to enter or dare to approach. And so like a, a pack of hyenas, these depraved servants of darkness, they approach the throne. And at their head is their ringleader, the worst of them all, Satan, who is greedily staring around at the surrounds. And he's maliciously smiling because of what he plans to do next yet again. And then without the least bit of reverence, without the least bit of willing deference that is given to the throne, he smugly starts to speak. And he begins to throw accusation after accusation around the, around the room. He, he points his scaly finger this way and that way and every way he can, hissing and spitting, animated by his hatred. And he challenges and he goads 
And he uses all of his considerable cunning and intellect to make his case. He is the accuser, verse 10, which is what the word Satan means, accuser or adversary. And though he is shown here as having some sort of presence in heaven's court, verse 7, he is the same dragon that is still poised on earth, raging and devouring the people of God in history, at least as far as he is permitted to do so. Accuser, Satan, dragon, and ancient serpent, verse 9. The same wicked creature who first came with whispered lies and evil suggestions to Eve in the Garden of Eden. You you see, he's, he's ancient, From the very beginning of creation, thousands of years old, with all that experience channeled into this work of of tempting and, and accusing and devouring the people of God. He is called the devil, verse 9. A word which, like Satan, has its origin in the word accuse or slander. Literally, it means to to throw across, and that's what he does here. He throws accusations across the the royal courtroom. He throws accusations across the face of the earth, and, and he slanders the people of God, even as he slanders God himself. And verse 9, he is called the deceiver of the whole world which gives you an idea of how far-reaching and how effective has been his work. Every nation, every culture, every people group has to some or other degree felt the insidious, deceptive influence of Satan upon it. Whether openly through bare-faced, child-sacrificing ancient paganism or through modern, socially acceptable, government-approved, celebrity-endorsed ideals, laws, and movements. The great enemy of man, Satan, the devil, the ancient serpent, the devouring dragon, and all of his demonic minions are at work. And they're at work now in the 21st century in our country, in our province, in our neighborhoods. Not so much possessing uh, the way that many sensational churches like to overemphasize, but just deceiving, deceiving, deceiving. He is the deceiver of the whole world. And so successful has he, has he been that most people, and even I would say most Christians, and I would dare to say some even in Goodwood Baptist Church, are totally ignorant of his scaly influence. But in this particular scene now, he is shown in heaven where for some time he had been keeping up his character and living up to his name, accusing. Like he did in Genesis 3 when Satan went to Eve and he said, you shall not surely die for God knows that when you eat of this fruit your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. In other words, God is lying to you. God is selfish. God isn't even worth your obedience. You can hear the accusations against God. You see it even more clearly in Job chapter 1. You, you know the story. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. There's your courtroom scene. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him and on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house on all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and the possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all he has, and he will curse you to your face. Uh, You you can hear the, the accusation. He accuses Job of a false faith, a fair weather Christianity. As long as things are going well, everything will be, uh, all the worship will be appropriately given. And he accuses God of encouraging it. No, Job only worships you, God, because you, you grease his palms. You pay him off. Of course he's going to honor you. Why wouldn't he? You give him everything he wants. Accusations. Again, Zechariah chapter 3. Joshua the high priest before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. 
The accuser goes off to the high priest, the one who would stand to make sacrifice in an attempt to undermine, to nullify any work he might do on behalf of sinners. And what's worse, like a very great many of Satan's accusations, there is some truth to some of them. You, you keep reading Zechariah 3, you find that Joshua the high priest is shown to be filthy, and he needs outside grace to come along and cleanse him to save him. Just as we would say the same of ourselves, many of the accusations of the enemy might easily have a ring of truth to them, wouldn't there? Could, could, you, could you imagine what he might say to us? You, you, you call yourself a Christian. You can't even get through one Sunday morning service without your mind wandering. What kind of devotion is that? And how many times have you had to learn the same lesson over the last 10 years? Twice? Three times? A dozen? Are you sure you saved it all? Wouldn't a true Christian have gotten the point a lot quicker? Think about it. And I know about that time you blessed God in the morning and not one hour later on the road you were cursing the taxi driver. Nice job, hero. Great work. Won't God be pleased? And I heard about what came out of your mouth when you lost your temper in that, that one moment of the day and you hit your thumb with the hammer or dropped that case on your toe. Guess that's what's really on the inside of you, huh? Now we know, now everyone knows what rotten fruit you are. And I see your covetous heart for what she has. You may be trying to fight it, but would a real Christian worth his or her salt even have the struggle at all? You miserable wretch. Your Savior died poor on the cross, and you have the audacity to be discontent with what he has given you? You worthless creature. Just, just get out of here. In fact, why do you stick around at all? I mean, you spend more time grumbling about the church or about the leadership than you've ever spent praying for anyone. What a hypocrite. And you're proud. And you're slow to forgive. And you're hot-headed and you've got a quick temper. And though your sunglasses might have hid your eyes and the direction of your gaze that one time at the beach, I know where they were looking. Are you sure the Holy Spirit is within you? I thought Christians were supposed to be better than this. God is never going to hear your prayers, the state you're in. You might as well not come to him at all. Get your act together first, and then we'll see if it's not already too late. And as for actually telling others about the gospel, about evangelism, what makes you think you are in any condition to even try? You don't love God as much as you should. You don't give him as much time as you could. You just don't deserve the forgiveness of heaven. And let's be honest, there's times when you secretly aren't sure you're even going there. You're a disappointment to yourself. How much more to Jesus Christ? How do you think he feels about you? Do you see? The accusations of the devil, the accusations of the evil one. And those Satan's inferences after the fact are often full of lies. The accusations themselves often have a, a kernel of truth to them, don't they? Those points in our lives where he might easily pick at, those those threads that he might easily pull upon and begin to unravel, are they there? Of course they are. They're there in my life. They're there in your life. And I'm not talking about, let me stress, I'm not talking about someone who is undisturbed by the fact of their sin and who shrugs and comfortably carries on and whose general living is marked by unrepentant unfaithfulness. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about true believers who are daily working at their repentance, but who look at their hearts and they hold up their life to the example of Christ, and they still see all, all their shortcomings. And they still feel their sin. And they're still acutely aware of times when their flesh overcomes them, and they, they say or do or think or act in a way that they know they shouldn't, and it grieves them, and they, they hate that about themselves. It's at that moment, as it were, that Satan, the adversary, the prosecutorial bully, he comes along, he puts his finger on the open wound, and he says, ah -ha! He is the accuser, in this case, in the court of the king. 
Well, that brings us to the second point, and here's where we start to look at the text in proper, an expulsion, an expulsion at the command of the king. The whole scene borrows from the language of Daniel 10, where this princely angel, this mighty archangel named Michael, is sent to the aid of Daniel in some sort of spiritual conflict with the demonic forces that were influencing the oppressive empires at that time. And, and also from Daniel 12, 12, where Michael rises up to act on behalf of God's people at the command of the Lord. It's the same imagery, the same language has now been borrowed by John and inserted here. Only what we need to understand that is here in Revelation what is happening is a consequence of what has happened on earth of the preceding verses. The child, recall, the child arrived. He was born, he lived, and he was caught up to the throne of God in heaven. Christ arrived, he ministered, he triumphed through the cross and the resurrection, he ascended to glory. That was from the vantage point of earth, a view from below. Now, as it were, verse 7 twisted around, and we have a view looking down from above. And we see from above that war broke out in the heavenly places. And Satan loses, and he's thrown down. This is happening simultaneously at the same moment as what we've already heard about. You say, but how do we know that? Couldn't this be some reference to a future battle, a prelude to Armageddon? No, because the vision interprets itself. Specifically, as is often the case in Revelation, the, the hymn or the song or the loud voice explains what has just taken place. It's not left up to the subjectivity of the reader's imagination. Look at verse 10. It interprets what has just happened. There is a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and authority of His Christ has come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. Uh, do, do you follow this? Just, just stay with me, this is important. The arrival of salvation and power and kingdom and authority is intricately linked to the defeat of Satan. War broke out and Satan was booted out because of something that is happening. All of which begs the question, when is this moment when salvation and power and kingdom and authority arrive? When is this moment when Satan, when Satan is cast down? And the answer is again with the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. This is not talking about some cosmic battle between angels and demons that takes place just before the second coming. This is not a glimpse at the future. This is talking about an event in the past, something that has already happened as the rest of chapter 12 and chapter 13 and so on will go on to make clear. Just listen to the language of the New Testament. I beg you, hear how it is that Jesus himself describes his ministry in the Gospels. It is described explicitly as the arrival of salvation and power and the kingdom and authority. Salvation. Luke 1.11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Verse 69 of Luke 1, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up for us a, a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. Verse 77, to give us knowledge of salvation. Chapter 2, verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. Chapter 3, verse 6, John quotes Isaiah about his ministry saying, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Luke 19, today salvation has come to this house. And power. Luke 4, after his temptation, where significantly Jesus has just overcome the devil, it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Luke 5, the power of God was on him with, him to, with him to heal. Luke 6, power came out of him. Luke 9, and he called together the twelve and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases. Salvation, power, and kingdom. Matthew 3, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Sending the disciples out, Matthew 10, proclaim as you go, the kingdom of God is at hand. 
Mark 9, 21, some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power, a reference to events in their lifetime. Luke 17, 21, behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Matthew 12, 28, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Salvation, and power, and kingdom, and the authority of Christ. Luke 4, what is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits when they come out. Matthew 9, healing the paralytic, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then says to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Mark 1, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. Mark 3, authority over demons. Mark 6, authority over unclean spirits. John 2, the, son of, the, the Father has given the Son authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given Him. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Do you see, this is just a selection of possible verses, dozens more. Luke 10 even ties them all together and then draws a straight line to Revelation 12. Listen to Luke 10, verses 1 to 16. Jesus appoints 72 disciples. He says, go out, preach, heal the sick, and say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. They do this. They come back. They're excited. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And do you remember what happens next? Verse 18. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then verse 19, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And then verse 20, Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. S salvation, uh, did you get the idea? Salvation and power and kingdom and authority have arrived in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as a consequence of that, exit the dragon. Satan is kicked out of the royal court. It's also why at his crucifixion, Jesus said, John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. He was speaking about a great victory that was about to be uh, uh, achieved over the great deceiver of the world, the devil. So, so come back to Revelation now. And what do we see here? Not some future event that's still going to happen but a view from heaven on what has already happened. Because of Jesus' arrival and ministry on earth, Satan is thrown down with prejudice. He falls like lightning. Or to return to the picture of our imperial throne room, there's Satan and his lackeys standing as they always do, laughing away. There's the devil and fine form, ranting and accusing, and he's, and he's listing all the sins of God's people, and he's gleefully appealing to God's own law to destroy humanity night and day as he's done for millennia, this dragon, this ancient serpent. But suddenly, on the cue from the king, at the predetermined moment, because of what the king's son is doing on earth, the archangel Michael ra raises his war horn and he gives it this, this deafening blast. And there's this metallic scraping as all the holy sentinels around the room draw their swords out of their sheaths. And like a highly disciplined armored unit, they step forward and advance as one upon the dragon and his angels, upon Satan and his demons, and they begin to war against them. And they battle with fury. Meanwhile, the, the demons themselves, surprised by the sudden turn of events, sit their eyes wide with sheer terror. But all the same, 
they fight back. But the outcome is never in doubt. The accuser is defeated. And there's no longer any place for them in heaven. They've lost their court privileges, their, their right of approach that was given to them for a time. And every single one of them is they're sort of hooked under the arms on either side, flanked by one of the angels, and they, they're dragged out, feet along the ground, bloodied and bruised, and they, they're thrown out, and they're thrown down uh, to the earth. And then there breaks out this victorious song in the heavenly places. A loud voice shouts in triumph, now the salvation and the power and the authority and the kingdom uh, of, our, of His Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And please, let's not get caught up in that typical Western fashion with the modern distractions that never would have occurred to the first century readers reading this. This is not about pinning down a precise chronology, the exact moment that Satan was booted out of heaven as it corresponds with the split-second moment of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's not about precision moments, nor is it about a strict geographical locality as though Satan was exclusively in heaven before and then he fell out and landed somewhere on the earth that there's a smoldering crater somewhere in the Golan Heights. No, this is symbolism and it is making a symbolic point using a symbolic history of something important for Christians to understand. Namely, that the whole legal foundation for Satan's malicious prosecution for his accusations has totally crumbled. Satan's accusations against God are shown to be baseless because look at the cross. Justice was served. The law was upheld. Sin was punished with the willing sacrifice of the Son. And Satan's accusations against Christians are shown to be toothless because look at the cross and look at the empty tomb and look at who is now on the throne. The Lamb is upon the throne. Jesus paid it all and you're safe if you are truly in Christ. It's why Colossians 2 says what it says. Do you remember? Maybe, maybe this will be the turning point for some of you as you understand this. After talking about the legal demands of God's own holy law against the sinner, it says this, this God set aside by nailing it to the cross he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Do you, do you see, the rulers and authorities in that context are clearly, undeniably spiritual foes and forces. But they have been disarmed, they have been shamed, they have been triumphed over by the work of Christ on the cross. So let's let Scripture interpret Scripture as we come to this book. That brings us then to the last point, because what, what does all this mean for you? What does it mean for me? We, we, we've sought to understand the text, but what does it mean for us? Something we'll pick up with in weeks ahead as well, but for the, for the time being, third point, an exclamation from the company of the king. You see, the, the, the consequences of Satan's defeat are many. For starters, most obviously, the dragon is declawed. The serpent is defanged. You remember those accusations from early on, the ones that had that uncomfortable ring of truth to them. How, how do you respond to that? Well, we, we, we don't dispute the truth of some of those allegations leveled against us. We are inconsistent at times. We do find ourselves harboring ungodly attitudes. We can be self-indulging. We, we, we sin. And, and we, we hate that about ourselves, don't we? We, we? we cry out, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? But 
we don't then capitulate to the devil in a case that has already been won on our behalf by Christ. We don't forget what he has done because as Romans 8 says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So as it were, if Satan accuses, you freely confess. I am a sinner. I do fall short. My heart does sometimes deceive me. But my hope is is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm saved entirely by divine divine grace, and I'm, I'm still dependent daily on heaven's mercy. And Christ helping me, when I fall, I will rise again. Seven times if necessary, and then seven times again. And take up my cross and follow Him. Because He is my everything and He is my all. But let me string together the next three consequences of Satan's defeat as they're found in the, the next three verses on this heavenly exclamation, the cry of victory in verses 10, 11, and 12. And again, remember the context. Those who were receiving this were persecuted, suffering first century Christians. What is the consequence of Christ's work and Satan's expulsion from heaven from their perspective looking down at us? What do they say? Well, they give both celebration and warning. Verse 10, kingdom come. Verse 11, conquering faith. Verse 12, devil's wrath upon the earth. Particularly, as we'll see in the next verses and chapters, his wrath against the church, his tribulation of the church. So there's rejoicing in heaven at the kingdom. Therefore rejoice, it says. There is rejoicing in heaven at Christians gathered into glory, faithful martyrs who have finished the, fight, uh, finished the race and fought the fight and so on. And, and they, there's rejoicing over them. But woe, warning to the earth and the sea. And all this should sound very familiar to you because do you remember how John introduced himself in Revelation chapter 1? He said, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Kingdom come, power, salvation, and authority. Conquering faith, requiring patience and endurance. Satanic persecution tribulation unleashed against the church. All three components were already there 2,000 years ago. And if for no other reason, this is especially relevant for 20th and 21st century Christians who often have the very wrong idea about these three areas. I, I, I say this with respect and not to give offense and with great admiration for many who do all the same, hold this view for, for uh, this view that, that I'm going to mention now. But it seems that many people, when they think of kingdom or when they read of kingdom, believe or emphasize a portion of a thousand years at the end of history. But John says the kingdom has arrived. It's why we have a message of salvation. It's why we have the authority to go out there and make disciples and to stand on Christ's authority when the world tells us otherwise. It's why Christians are being sanctified by His power because the kingdom has come and the kingdom is here. Others believe that perseverance isn't really necessary. Because once saved, always saved, and as long as you can dimly remember some prayer from 20 years ago, were you sincere, you were at the time, okay, good, then you're safe, not to worry, you'll be fine, just just plod along and carry on, regardless of how you've lived. But John says, 
in chapter 1 and now in chapter 12 that salvation requires patient endurance. It requires overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It, it, is, it is to persevere in the faith. It is to have a reason for the hope that is within you right now, not as a passing reference to something that happened 20 or 30 years ago. Are you in Christ right now? You must persevere in the faith. How different from the, modern, the average modern church's understanding. Yeah, I got my kid to say the sinner's prayer when they were four years old. I'm absolutely confident that they're in Christ despite the fact that they're now 64 and have not lifted one finger in worship of God for the last 60 years. Well, you know, you, you give me five minutes with a child and I can get them to say a sinner's prayer. It's the easiest thing in the world. It does not make them a Christian. Is there true regeneration of the, by the Spirit in a person's life? Are they in Christ? You will know by their fruit. You will see by their patient endurance, by their overcoming. And again, most believe that tribulation is something that happens apart from the church, that the church will be raptured out of it, that we will escape it, that we will be exempt. But John says in chapter 1 and again over here, we're in it. We're in it as does any honest reading of church history. And the more faithful and public your witness, the more obvious it will become to you because the world will not tolerate your witness. What's more, John also makes plain that these things are part of what bonds Christians together in unity, what makes us one. He says, I, your partner and brother, with you in these things. Now, we're going to explore more about this in the weeks ahead. Verse 12 is just announcing the devil's wrath. There's a lot much more to be said. I just want us to understand that these are the consequences of Satan's defeat. So summarizing the whole passage, it was the occasion of Christ's arrival and ministry that triggered war in the heavenly places, the collapse of Satan's legal case, the arrival of the kingdom, the wrath of the dragon against the church, and the need for patient endurance by those who conquer. And looking down upon the earth, that great throng above, that great host, sings out in celebration because they know Christ has already won. And they wait eagerly for us to join them in their ranks over the course of history. And you may say with confidence in the words of the hymn writer, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. I look to heaven and I see him there. I see Christ there who made an end to all my sin. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, help us to live with a fuller understanding of the majest magisterial work, the majestic work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, and with a sober awareness of the intent and design of our enemies, the great enemy himself, Satan, to destroy discourage and disperse the church. We ask, O oh, our Father in heaven, that you would help us to overcome because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. Amen.